Welcome back, friends. Part two of the Wikipedia Top 100 of all time, in which we will be going through my games numbers 90 to 81. Though, of course, as I said in my intro video, a numerical assignment is somewhat arbitrary. What I what I've done here is is I've divided up rather than 100 list of games absolute just different categories of types of games, how I quantify them according to themes that I'd like to discuss in terms of all of them as they've shaped my character as a gamer, and hopefully some of yours as well. Now, to last week, last time, we talked about my legacy games, which are games which are absolutely important to, to my development as a gamer, but which I maybe don't play anymore. Now, what, what I'm doing today are my guilty pleasure games. These are games, and we all have them, that we play and we might enjoy, although we acknowledge they're not particularly great games. And the way I've ranked them is from the one I feel most guilty about to the one I feel least guilty about. And of course, starting off with number 90, there is no game that anyone can enjoy that you can feel more guilty about, except maybe Cards Against Humanity, than this one, which is Flux. Now, Flux is not a good game. It's not even a game, right? It's just an activity. Flux is terrific if you don't know how long it's going to be till your friends get there to get the game night because you don't care when the game ends. It's like, oh, we're playing Flux, what are my objectives, blah, blah, blah. Oh, they're here? Okay, never mind, now let's play something real, right? Um, the version of Flux that I'm gonna hone in on is the Monty Python Flux. Because if the purpose of the game is not necessarily to be a complicated game with strategy and math and all that kind of good stuff, but rather just a fun activity, then this one does it. It, it captures the spirit of your Monty Python movies and your Monty Python TV shows. In a perfect way where you can be singing about spam one minute and killing the Black Knight the next minute. Again, not a terrific game, but I've absolutely enjoyed every time I have played my number 90 game, Monty Python Flux. Alright, next one, number 89 game that I feel slightly less guilty about than enjoying Mind of Python Flux is Kingdom Builder. Now, Kingdom Builder should have hit the board game universe like a proverbial ton of bricks as the follow-up to Donald X. Vaccarino's Dominion, the game-changing, world-changing Dominion, but it, it, it kind of just fizzled out. And there have been a lot of expansions to it, so people must be buying it. I remember playing it and enjoying it. I've got nothing wrong with the game. I think it's very simple. I do think it is a better gateway game than Settlers because there's less luck involved. And so you don't have that phenomenon of people being cheated by, oh, the dice didn't go my way. There's, there's almost no opportunity at all for analysis paralysis. I remember I did a piece on this, oh, one of my very first episodes for, for Board Game Breakfast, wherein I talked about, oh, oh yeah, there I am. Yes, you see, there I am talking about Kingdom Builder in 2014. Oh, young Jared, all the things in 2015, all the mistakes you're going to make, I wish I could warn you. But alas, I cannot. Kingdom Builder, love to play it, it's a, it's a great game, I don't get to play it as much as maybe I'd like. Maybe if I did play it a lot, I'd run out of interest in it, but I do think it is a good game. Kingdom Builder. Okay, my next game, when I was coming, when I was coming up with this list, I knew, I knew two games exactly what their numbers would be, even though again these numbers are kind of arbitrary. I knew absolutely without question what my number one would be, I look forward to seeing if any of you can guess what you think it might be. But then I knew my number 88 had to be Formula D. For two reasons. One, Formula D is always number 88 on the people's choice, for whatever reason. And also, I think there's just something about driving cars really fast where the number 88 has special significance. 88 miles per hour! So, the, the idea with Formula D is that the, the strategy is which, which gear am I going to go into for different segments of the game based on the risk that I need to take. Your lowest gear, you're rolling a D4. Your next gear, you're rolling a D6, and a D8, and a D10. Uh, they're not exactly numerically the same as like your Dungeons and Dragons D8s or D10s. Be there's no, there's no uh, curve from like one to eight, which actually makes it better. It's more realistic for 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 a, a racing type game. And then there's the risk of okay, well, do I try to blast through this corner or do I try to gear down and take it more slowly? When do I burn my tires? based on, you know, the resources that you're allotted at the beginning. It is the kind of game where when you get behind, it can be kind of disheartening and you think you can't get back. But but when you when that does happen, when someone comes from behind and is able to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat, 
That is a fantastic experience. This is one of those games, and I'm going to try to channel the kind of thing I think Z Garcia would say, or maybe already has said. This is the game where people are going to make noise while they're playing it, right? This is the game where you hope that you're at that table on board game night instead of at the quiet board table playing Hands of Teutonica or something terrible like that. No offense to all you Hands of Teutonic fans. Formula D. It's not a terrific game, not a lot of strategy to it, but you'll absolutely have fun with it in my guilty pleasure in number 88. Number 87. <laughs> Okay, uh, as I said last week when I was talking about some of my legacy customizable card games, I was never a Magic the Gathering fan. I never got into it. It's probably why I was able to uh, afford to go to college, to be honest. Um, but there, there's a, a, a Magic variant nowadays that I do enjoy playing, the Adventure Time card game. What I specifically enjoy about playing it with is that one of my nieces is a huge fan of Adventure Time. She loves the game, and it's fun to square off against her. It's also the kind of game where, you know, it's very competitive and you're trying to kill the other side, but it never gets mean-spirited. It's hard to take things too seriously when you have these, you know, fun Adventure Time cartoon images. It's lighthearted. It's a lot of fun. It's a good game. There's been plenty of expansions. There'll probably be more. My anti-Magic the Gathering Adventure Time card game. Now, do you like sushi? I like sushi, and sometimes I like sushi to go. And so we come to Sushi Go. It's a very simple, simple game uh, about creating your ideal Japanese meal. You know, it's not just sushi, of course. You've got your sashimi and your tempura and all that kind of good stuff. Um, it's, it's a very simple drafting mechanism. This would be a good intro game to, sh to teach someone before you introduce them to your Seven Wonders or other more complicated drafting games. There's not a lot to it, right? The main basic decisions are going to be do I want this card that's worth two points, or do I want to take risk on this card that might be worth five points, essentially? It's a lot of fun. The art is cute. I've played it a lot. I hope to play it more in the future. It, unlike Flux, is a filler game where when the other people from for Board Game Night come, they're a little bit late. You might wait to join in with them because you want to finish your Sushi Go. Plays in three rounds. I think you can do it in half an hour, especially if everyone knows what's going on. And a delightful game to play if you have any kind of you know, Japanese-themed night with some actual sushi out, which you which you can enjoy. While take you can enjoy this sushi at home while taking this game to go. Number eighty-six, sushi go. Okay, number eighty-five is a grim kind of horror-themed game, very lighthearted, in in your same vein as as your Adams Family type of thing. If you enjoy that, it is called Bring Out Your Dead. This is a copy that I got at Origins last year. Unfortunately, I was not able to get a signed copy from the uh, from the creator, although I was able to play with him there, which was great. He's from Utah, just like me, so it's a small world. So Bring Out Your Dead is a, as it, it advertises, a morbid game of family fun. You, for meeples, look what we have. We have actual little coffins instead of people. See, and then we bury them here, right, on the plots. Maybe you've seen this game before, for different points. Uh, there's, there's the different cards you can use for bonus effects. You know, we, we have these, these different options for trying to bury your cards or these different treasures you can get. And it kind of is, is said without being said, but you get these treasures by looting the corpses of your of your ancestors, which is, is morbid and delightful and, again, very Adam's family. The thing I like is it incorporates elements of area control, worker placement, and deck building in a simple way that you can... You, it's like a sampler platter, so it's a great way to introduce these ideas to your friends of, her, you, friends of yours who, who may need to see this as a gateway game, and it's a good way to say, okay, here's here's these concepts, and then try more advanced games. A bit of a guilty pleasure, because again, for us as more hardcore gamers, it's it's not it's not the most intense game at all, but it is still a lot of fun. It's fun to look at, and it's easy, it's easy to teach and get people involved in. So, bring out your dead. So, something that always fascinates me are games that carve off a sliver of the dungeon crawler experience, and, the, and then make that the game, right? Um, so, for example, last time we talked about Three Dragon Ante, the idea is that's a card game that you can play in, in your role-playing, fantasy role-playing universe, uh, uh, either as part of the role-playing experience or on its own. Now, this game, it, which again, is not a terrific game, there's not a lot of strategy to it, but it is terrifically fun, it takes the idea of what happens after the adventure when the heroes get back to the tavern. And not just any tavern, but the Red Dragon Inn. 
So everyone has a different deck of cards. You pick a character and all those cards come with it. You may be the halfling rogue or you may be the, the half-orc barbarian or you may be the paladin or the cleric or the, or the wizard who's got a familiar named Pookie who can pull off all kinds of tricks. And then you play these cards on each other to try to either beat someone up, take all their money, or get them so drunk they pass out. There's loads of expansions for this game. I haven't played all of them because there's so many. I kind of lost track about it. Red Dragon Inn is, is always fun. It's, uh, it's very much a take that game, but it never, I've never seen it get too personal or, or cause anyone to explode in rage or flip the table or whatever cliche you want to use. It's a fantastic game. I, I recommend it highly. My guilty pleasure, Red Dragon Inn. Number 83. Okay, so my, my number 83 game, my, uh, next one on my guilty pleasures list, is Game of Thrones Westeros Intrigue. Now, this game, and I talked about it last year when I did some episodes about Game of Thrones. The idea is it's, it's, it's like a math problem where you're building up this stack and, and people have these different factions from within the Game of Thrones universe where, oh, you're the Starks, or you're the Lannisters, or you're the Targaryens, or the, or the Baratheons. And you're trying to get to the top, right? There's... It, this is not a deep strategy game at all. This is the kind of game where I, I think Reiner Knizia came up with this when he was on a long bus trip, right? I think it probably took him 25 minutes to, to come up with this game. And then they just put, pasted the Game of Thrones theme on it, and he cashed a check. Uh, I, I wouldn't put it as necessarily the best game in the universe to play, but it is the absolute best game for teaching someone about the Game of Thrones universe, right? Because you got the pictures there with the names on them and the faces. And so you can say, oh yes, this is the difference between these three different warriors who have pretty much similar stories and look very much alike and have names you can't really keep track of. To sort of help people indoctrinate them, introduce them to the, that fantasy universe. And it is still a fun game. And it's a great way, it's a great way to start off an evening with that lighter game. So, my number 83, Game of Thrones, Westeros Intrigue. Number 82! Okay, so the next one on my list, my, my number 82, and my guilty pleasure game I am second least guilty about. This one really surprised me when it won the Spiel des Jahres, because it doesn't seem at all like the kind of game that does that. And it is, probably you know already, Colt Express. Here, the idea is we have, and I, and I don't have it right now here with me, unfortunately. Um, there is a very good implementation of it on Board Game Arena, which I recommend you check out if you haven't had a chance to. The idea is we're all involved in this train robbery, and the train goes from different stops, and we have this occasion to pick up loot, to try to steal from the marshal, to, to get jewels or cash from, from people who are there on the train, and whoever gets the most money when the train finally reaches its end destination is the winner. Uh, the the gameplay comes from trying from remembering what cards your opponents have played and trying to adjust your strategy accordingly. It's, it's the, 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 the hallmark of the game is, of course, that they have this this wonderful set that you build up of the little train and you got the little peoples on it. it it's not the not the most deeply strategic game in the world, but it, it is a tremendous amount of fun. And it's also one of those, it's it's what I call a potato chip game, where you play it once and you have to play it again, right? Once is never enough with Cult Express, my number 82. So my guilty pleasure game that I feel the least guilty about putting on this list, it's also my number 81. This may surprise some of you if this is so low, you may think it should be higher. I know there was, uh, it is ranked very highly every year on the Dice Tower People's Choice, but I do feel a little guilty about this game, and it is namely King of Tokyo. Now, you guys have all played this. It's a very fun game. King of Tokyo, we are monsters fighting for domination of Tokyo, and with five or six players, Tokyo Bay, using a dice rolling mechanism. It's, it's one of those games that I think may have replaced 10,000, which I mentioned in my first video, in terms of a game that's that's uh, a little more, still has that push your luck dynamic, but it's a little more advanced and there's more going on. It is very luck based. If the right, if the right uh, power up card comes out and your neighbor gets it instead of you, that might mean that they're going to win and, and you're and you're doomed. And because there's the dice rolling, there's so much luck, things may just never go your way. But it is still a fantastic game, very popular. I do like it better than King of New York. The thing I like about King of Tokyo better than King of New York is there are fewer resources to extend the game too long, right? I'm a big fan of a game filling its appropriate length, right? You don't want to have 20 minutes worth of fun packed into an hour of game. And this one, 
in my experience, always ends when it should. Sometimes as King of New York, we, we played it once in this very room here, where there were six people playing, it was going to be awesome, three people died very early on, and three the other three got so many power-ups, they were just going on indefinitely, that we eventually just called the game, right? And I've never experienced that with this. So, my least guilty, guilty pleasure game, my number 81, King of Tokyo. So, there we go. That Those are my guilty pleasure games. Thanks for coming with on the journey. I hope you don't feel guilty about spending the last 10 minutes on this video on YouTube. Please be sure to put any comments, things, feedback you may have. And if you feel compelled to share this or click the like button, well, of course, I'm not going to complain about that. And be sure to tune in next time when our theme will be Hidden Gems Games. And this will be my numbers, 80 down to 71. Hidden Gems. And these are games that have never appeared on the Dice Tower People's Choice in any year that it's been going. What will they be? I can't wait to find out. Next time.